So biochemistry, atoms to molecules to cells. That's the name of the chapter. I like this, this book, Atoms to Molecules to Cells. Now this is an introductory uh, chapter that you read yesterday. It's a college textbook. I think it was really, I think they did a good job summarizing everything. Of course, we're going to go into detail over the next couple weeks on a lot of the stuff in the chapter. Uh, you're going to express, you're going to ex, I'm going to explain it, you're going to practice it, you're going to take quiz questions on it, you're going to do a test on it. You need to know this stuff in May. You need to understand these molecules. So, what are atoms, molecules, that what, we start with atoms, for those of you that have not taken any kind of chemistry. Atoms are the smallest component of matter that still retain the properties of that matter. Atoms are made of smaller particles, are they not? Who knows what their atoms are made of? What are atoms made of? That's right, neutrons. That's right. Neutrons, electrons, and protons. I am not going to go over all the, the chemistry behind all this. Those of you that have had no chemistry, I think there's like six of you, you're going to have to catch up some way or another. I will have to come up with some extra activities for you to focus on over the next few weeks uh, so, to help you catch up. In the nucleus, and this is, almost all the chemistry is kind of based on these kind of fundamental properties. And one of the, these fundamental properties is that like charges do what? What do like charges do? Do they attract each other? They attract each other, yeah. They repel each other. The word is repel. They don't attract. They do the opposite of attract. And you've heard, you've heard the, the other saying that opposite charges do what? They attract. So opposite charges attract. You've heard of opposites attract. So the force is moving in that direction where they're pulling towards each other and the light charges repel each other. I don't know why I put repel. <laughs> and so that kind of leads to a problem when you think of a nucleus. A nucleus has a bunch of protons and neutrons in it. And the question is, why are the neutrons there? They have neutrons, by the way, have no charge equals zero charge. And when I say positive and negative, you know it's like your battery, right? You see in the battery you have a positive and negative on your battery. So it's the same thing. Electrons are negative, that's right. One negative charge. And the protons equal one positive charge. So those of you taking physical science should know that already. Those of you taking chemistry should know this already. So the opposite charges repel. What do you think is happening? If this is the nucleus. What is happening in that nucleus? Are the, what are the positives doing to the positives? They're repelling each other. They're pushing each other away. So what holds this nucleus together? Now, the neutrons are part of the process, but it's called, the force is called strong force. Strong force holds these, this nucleus together. So you have a nucleus that's being held together, because normally they would repel. Something has to be holding it all together. This thing called strong force is holding it together. But the atom is this tiny, the nucleus of the atoms is tiny dot. And if that dot were the size of a baseball, then the electrons would be, as the electrons would be all the way out here. It would be like as if, that would be as if the baseball were in the middle of, of, Jacob, of uh, progressive field. And then all the way out in the outer stands, all the way up, you know, the highest most stand would be the first electron you'd see. 
That's how far away, how much space there is between an atom, the parts of an atom. In fact, you are made of atoms, right? Everything you experience is made of atoms. So this, what this means, the consequence of this means that you are made mostly of what? Made mostly of what? what, what when you look at what, how much space you take up, what is most of what you... Look at the atom. Look at this atom. If, there's, if, there's, if this atom has, let's say this atom is helium, helium has two protons, has two neutrons, and has two electrons, okay? So there's two protons in here, so it's a plus two, right? And then there's two electrons, and they would have to be as far, why would they, electrons want to be as far away from each other as they could possibly be, why? Because they're both positive or they're both negative? They're both negative. And so because they're both negative, what do they do? Repel each other, so they're going to be as far away from each other. That's really, if you think about that, and you learn that, that opposites, that light charges repel and the opposites attract, that explains most of what, what's going on here. This is a system that can be explained by a simple process. It's electromagnetic force, right? So you're made, actually you're made mostly of space. Most of you is empty space. Look at it. If this is an atom, you're made mostly of atoms, right? This is one of the simpler atoms called helium. You're actually made mostly of this other atom called carbon, and we'll be talking about that in just a minute. When you look at how this atom that's helium only has two protons, they're in here, two neutrons are in here. All the mass of the atom, most of the mass of the atoms here, most of the charge of the atom on the outside is out here. It's neutral. Why is helium neutral? Look at this and tell me why is helium neutral? Yeah, Baron. Oh, I shouldn't say your name. Sorry. Because all the there's two positives and two negatives. They can't That's it. Two positives and two negatives. Two minus two is zero. zero. So the net charge on this is zero. That's why the most things that you experience in, around here have no charge. You don't get electrocuted, and when you touch it, and when you touch the table, right? Because you have there's no charge. Why? Because they neutralize each other. Well, this is a, these electrons are on the outside of this atom, inside the center of the positive charges. What's holding the electrons to the protons, to that nucleus so far away? Force. Not strong force. Strong force is holding the protons to each other in the nucleus. What's holding this electron to this, this nucleus? The electrons are what charge? Negative. Negative. The protons are? So what is that? So they're opposite, so they're attracting. Electromagnetic force is attracting. Opposite charges attract. So here's this helium atom sitting here, the sim one of the simpler atoms. It's made mostly of space. You are made mostly of space. That chair you're sitting on is made mostly of empty space. We know this, and I can explain to you, and we will go through Rutherford's first experiments that kind of told us what the structure of an atom was, but an atom is made mostly of space. You're made mostly of atoms, so you are made mostly of space. space. It's logic, isn't it? It's logical thinking. An atom is made mostly of space, you are made mostly of atoms, therefore, you are made mostly of space. So is everything else around you. You're sitting mostly on empty space. Why don't you just flow right through it? You've seen these movies, these Marvel movies, right? You've seen, uh, what's it, the Infinity, uh, what's it, the latest one, the later? Infinity War. Infinity War, you saw the other one, the one before that, where the guy with the, sto the stone in his head. I mean, sorry, uh, vision. vision. Vision, right? You see, he can go through the floor, right? He can go through walls, right? Do you ever wonder where they got that idea? They got that idea because matter is made mostly of space, and people thought, well, what if... What if you could vibrate the atoms in such a way as they offset each other? You could phase through, they call it, say, phase through solid materials. It's fantasy, right? But the point is that they got that fantasy from the reality that matter is made mostly of space. Yeah. That's also what Shadow Cat can do in the X Men. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of these, a lot of these. Yeah, a lot of these a lot of these fantasy heroes and villains they they take advantage of science. 
so they learn something in a science classroom somewhere, and they're like, what if? Right? What if? And then, and then yeah. Oh, also, the atom. We can make atoms. We can take we can take these components. What's an atom made of? Protons, neutrons, and electrons. We have these things called super colliders, and we can actually speed up protons and neutrons and smash them together. And we can make atoms. We can make gold. We can take hydrogen and put it together with. Uh, we can rip hydrogen off of a molecule called water. Rip the hydrogen off, collect it in a beaker. Then we can sh send those, that hydrogen, positively, positively charged hydrogen atom, through a super collider to a bunch of magnets miles long. Speed them at each other, smash them together, and make an atom of gold. Uh, the, why don't we make all the gold we want? Because it costs more than the gold is worth. It, take, it costs a lot of electricity, a lot of resources. Yeah. They made a machine like that uh, called a particle accelerator in the flash, and it exploded and had a bunch of names. That's right. That's, again, what did I say about this, these Marvel comic things? What are they based on? Science. Science. They're based on reality. We do have a particle accelerator. They do exist. We have, we have one in, in Rochester, New York, America, an American one. They're building, I think they're building a newer one, a uh, bigger one here in the United States. And there's this place called CERN. Have you heard of CERN? In CERN, they have a particle accelerator as well. And it's, uh, these particle accelerators are where they're taking these atoms and they're speeding them along mile-long tracks using magnets, making them move really, really fast, and then smashing them together. And they release all kinds of energy, and they're able to tell what is a proton made of, what's an electron. Because see, protons are made of something. Electrons are made of something. There are these things called peons and nuons and, and, and just all kinds of weird names. Uh, quarks and positive, positively charged quarks and, and negatively charged quarks. There's positrons as well as electrons. There's antimatter as well as matter. There's something called dark matter that we can't even see or touch or feel or inter interact with. So all this stuff exists. Science is a lot cooler than the Marvel comics. It's just that people don't know about it because they don't want to spend the time learning about it. Yeah? Um, can you replicate an atom in a We can make atoms, as I just said. We live. Oh, you mean, you, you mean can, can, we, can we teleport an atom? Are you saying, can we take an atom here and then send it to New York? Through space. Like how cells replicate. I'm saying, can you replicate? You put it like you like like take the atom and then do something to it to like make it to generate itself. Oh, so replicate. Yeah. Einstein. Einstein. Einstein had this equation. What this equation means, and I'm sure you've seen it. Yeah, it's it's made it's it was the basis of the atomic bomb. Yeah, it's it's there's a lot more to it. All right, so I'm make I'm simplifying it. I don't understand most of it, so let's get that clear. But there is there is something called this. What this equation says is yes, you can. And the way it, how does it say that? The way it says that is that what it what this equation says is energy equals matter or mass times the speed of light squared. So we can take energy, light, heat, right? Any kind of form of energy. And we can take it and turn it into what? If we rearrange the equation, we can do this, can't we? Right? C is, C is the speed of light. M is ma mass, so you have to have mass. Not everything has mass. Light, for instance, does not have mass. And E is equal to energy. So the, this famous equation that everybody is interested in 
that you've seen all over t-shirts, etc., actually says that you can make matter. But you need energy. Does that make sense? You need to take energy and turn it into matter. And then you can take matter and you can turn it into energy. So that leads us to another, that leads us to another, this equation, this form of the equation led us to, to what? The atomic bomb. Little boy, I think it's, uh, what was it, fat something? Yeah. What, what was it? Yeah. Fat man and little boy, I think it was. Where this, this, uh, this equation led to the first atomic bomb. We took matter, what is an atomic bomb? You're taking matter, specifically a radioactive element like plutonium. It's very unstable, and you're pushing it together. And you're forcing what? The protons to get too close. What do the protons do to each other then? They repel, and they repel in such a chain reaction that they start to move really quickly and release all their, all that strong, a lot of that energy that we just talked about, things like strong force and all the other pieces of energy. I don't understand it, as I said. But all that energy that's in that atom, a lot of it gets released, and that's, what you, that's when you have an atomic bomb. Okay? That's what an atomic bomb is. That's what atomic energy is. We don't have to have a bomb. We can use that, release a controlled atomic reaction. Well, this is called fission. That's breaking up an atom, right? We can control the release of that, and what we call that is nuclear energy. Now, why are we afraid of nuclear energy? Because it can have a meltdown. It's radioactive. It may, mainly because of the waste. We don't know what to do with the waste. The waste that's radioactive can be radioactive anywhere from 30 years later to 10,000 years later. So what do you do with stuff that's that radioactive for that long? So, but everybody just start getting like cancer? If you go near it, yeah. We have two nuclear power plants. One in Perry, that's near Sandusky. You see these things, there's, usually, there's two of them on each, on each site. These things called water towers, water cooling towers, and they release clean, warm steam. The steam is cooling off the pipes. All this nuclear energy is just a way of heating up water to turn turbines to make electricity. The electricity that you use if you're part of the illuminating company comes from nuclear power. There's two nuclear power plants on Lake Erie. Yeah. At least on, in, in the Cleveland area. Yeah. So I was reading this uh, story one time, and they used a, what you call it, a nuclear power plant that blew up somewhere? That's right. There's two, they, it's in Chernobyl. I don't know about your story, but there's a place called Chernobyl. You guys can look it up. You, there's actually a really great documentary. It's still radioactive to this day. They, it melted the tower. And the core, it had a full meltdown. This is what we call a meltdown. I got a question about that. Yeah. So just hold. The people that had, like, lived there and stuff like that, that... They got cancer. They, they died immediately. They got cancer. There's still people uh, that are trying to clean up now. They moved out. Some of those people moved back in because they got nowhere to live. And they're just, they're going to get cancer. So it's like the people that was living there when it happened, and they go somewhere else, do they spread... What a great question. When they left, they were, re they, were, they were required to remove all their clothes, and then they got scrubbed down so that any radioactive material on the outside got left there. And yes, they could take some radioactive material with them if they weren't careful, but really the impact, the negative impact of the radiation has already happened to them. So over time, the radiation is going to get them. It's likely. Already, the, the cancer will develop in these people. And indeed, we see that there's a higher rate of cancer among people that were exposed to radiation during the Chernobyl incident. Chernobyl is one, one of many, of three big ones that I can mention. There's another place called Fukushima. And I'm misspelling it, I know, I apologize. But Fukushima is in Japan, it happened more recently. And that released, that released radioactive material 
into the environment. And in Fukushima, it's got to the point where the old people in Japan, a lot of the old people, they're like, look, it's going to take 10, 15 years to get cancer, so I'm just going to go in there and I'm going to help clean this mess up. Because I'll probably be dead before I get cancer, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. That's pretty brave, I think. It's a pretty, pretty brave thing to do. Uh, but there's, there, this has led to a lot of issues in, in Japan. Japan is on a, on, a, on a fault zone. There's earthquakes, and they built a nuclear power plant on one of those zones, and that's what happened at an earthquake. I think it might have been even a tsunami, I can't remember, and that caused the Fukushima incident. There's another incident that you may not have heard about since it was before you were born in the 70s. There's a place called Three Mile Island. Who saw the movie uh, Wolverine? All right. Do you remember when he was battling his brother on top of the tower? And, and, they, and they, they battled each other, and the tower uh, collapsed. Yeah. And that was in Pittsburgh, that was in, not Pittsburgh, but in Pennsylvania. That was on a place called Three Mile Island. That actually happened. It didn't collapse like that. But they actually had an incident in Three Mile Island where it almost melted down. So that's where they, ref they reference that. In, in a lot of these Marvel movies, they reference history. So that incident that happened in, in, in the movie Wolverine actually did, that incident did happen in the, on this nuclear power plant on, on this island. It's an island in a river, it's not an island in a lake, in Pennsylvania, yeah. What does that say, the meltdown? Fukushima, I can't spell it. Somebody can look it up if they, if they like, but I can't spell it. I don't, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna focus on that. So that's, that's nuclear energy, and we can talk. More, we will talk more about that later in the year. But the key is that this is called fission. There is another way of doing of getting energy from the atom, and that's by instead of breaking it up, actually putting them together releases even more energy. Putting them together, putting two of these things together to form a bigger one, actually releases a lot of energy, and that process is called fusion. Fusion is probably the future of energy production for the, for the human race, assuming we live long enough to take advantage of it. We have, as a species, if we're, long, if we're around long enough, we have three, I think it is, three or four fusion power plants being uh, built today based on this idea. Uh, again, I'm going to reference these Marvel movies because you guys have all seen them. Have anyone ever seen the Doc Ock movie, the octopus, the guy with the, the eight arms? The Spider-Man one with eight arms. Have you seen that one? Yeah. Where he had that big ball of energy and, and, and the big ring sw swirling around it. That's what they think of as fusion. These are fusion reactors. And these fusion reactors, uh, they actually have a, a, a jaded history because it's really hard to do cold fusion. That is to get fusion to happen and produce more energy than you than you used to make it. But we're getting there. We're very close to getting it. That, that means that you could take, theoretically, in the end, assuming you're able to do it, you can take garbage, put garbage in. Now, it, actually, you need, you need a specific element, but let's just talk about the theory. Take garbage, and you stick it in a fusion reactor, in a box, and what you get out is clean energy. No carbon dioxide, no radioactive material, you just get energy to run your stuff. Wouldn't that be cool? Yeah. And that's, this is what the sun runs on. Our sun runs on fusion energy. Our sun is taking hydrogen and helium and it's smashing them together to make bigger elements. So fusion and fission, two different uh, ways of producing energy using the atom. I see a couple hands. I'm going. Yeah. Have you ever seen the movie Doctor Strange? Mm-hmm. Like when they make the portals, they have to consider those portals, those transportation portals. That's another. That's another. That's a. That's an idea of creating wormholes, right? So that's the idea of creating connections between space, right? So imagine you have to go from. Let's say we were here, and you wanted to go all the way over here. This is. 
you know, U.S., this is Russia. So let's say you wanted to travel, you have to actually go around the world, don't you? On a, in a plane or on water or on land, you have, to, you have to travel that distance. Well, what if you could fold space? What if you could take, if, if, if space were a sheet of paper, and you could fold it and put them right next to each other so that the dots are literally right next to each other, and then you poke a hole in it, and then you walk through, and then so you go from here to here, right? Walk through the hole, and then unfold it. So that you go, you started here, and you end up over here because you walk through the hole while you folded space. That's called that's called uh, you know creating wormholes or controlled wormholes. It's all theory. No one's done anything like that. All right. That but they but people have thought about maybe that's possible. Yeah. Uh, in Doctor Strange, the, the ancient one, she explained it along the lines of that they were using the energy throughout the universe, the universe, and they were manipulating it to create those. Also, that's similar to the Tesseract. Book. I'm going off of what I read in the book, not what. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. We're gonna. They, there's a lot of there's a lot of lore. They create the lore in order to explain the universe, which is fine. But the point is that it's based on science, right? All right, so just to, I, I know I, there's a lot to talk about. I would love to talk about, I love comic books, I love Marvel movies, so I, I, I would talk about it all day, but we don't have time, so, yeah. Make HIV? There's a lot of stories about that. I'm not sure about that. Could it have been an accident where a virus? That, we will talk about viruses, and we can make viruses, and we can we can we can adjust. In fact, we're using HIV and some other viruses, a herpes virus as well, to attack cancer. We we've taken those viruses, we've changed the DNA, and we're using we've made them instead of targeting you, your normal cells. They target your cancer cells. And we've actually come up with some successful treatments. Not 100% successful yet, but we're on the verge of using viruses to attack cancers and get rid of cancers. So imagine you've got a cancer. Instead of them operating on you, they inject you with a virus, and it's cured. We're not going to get into any more theoretical discussions if these questions are about theory. Go ahead. Oh, this one's not theory. It actually is working right now. Uh -huh. And they're taking... Uh, cat embryo, and they're injecting it with the DNA of a jellyfish yep. that it has bio oh, yeah. that's bioluminescent. And what they injected with it, one of the reactions is that it glows in the dark now. And another reaction is that uh, when they injected it with AIDS, it fought it off completely, and the uh, cat is now immune to any form of AIDS. Well, that wasn't because of the of the fluorescence. Bio bioluminescence is used all the time. In fact. If we have it again this year, there'll be four students in ninth grade now that will be doing, actually creating bioluminescent fish, uh, putting human genes into fish. Uh, so we do that every summer. Uh, we go to Case Western Reserve Medical School, and four of us, four students and myself, we work in that lab. You were sent the magazine in the fall, if you look at your Jupiter grade messages, Ms. Perez sent it to you. But anyways, that's not the point. Bioluminescence has been used for a, for a fairly long time. We've been able to isolate first the luciferase gene from fireflies, and then the jellyfish glow-in-the-dark genes, it was called uh, green fluorescent protein, from jellyfish. We've also isolated many other colors as well. So today we can put those genes in anything. We can adjust those genes, and we can make viruses, and, and we can, we've actually made a synthetic cell so we can do all that kind of stuff. But here we're not talking about cells yet. What are we talking about? Atoms. 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 We haven't even gotten to molecules. We've talked about space, and we've talked about energy, and we've talked about matter. I think that's successful. But now let's talk about, let's talk about something else. Let's talk about the next level. So we talked about atoms, and there's 100 plus atoms, right, types of atoms. What do we call those different types of atoms? What do we call those? 
Elements. Elements. Are called elements. So the elements are just types of mat of atoms. So what are the different elements? You have hydrogen, which only has one, and then you have helium, and then you have lithium. And there's there's all kinds. There's all there there's a hundred some odd. The first two rows of the periodic table. There's this thing called the periodic table. It looks like this, right? You've seen it. The first two rows we call the first two periods. That's the ones that we're, we're really interested in biology. Because that's where most of life, the molecules that make you up, that have to do with life, they're, all, most of those elements are here in these first two rows. But even if we go into the first three or four rows, that's about it. These elements down here, all the elements below this, they're really interesting for chemistry and, nu and nuclear the nuclear ones are over here, and these little two, and these two rows are down here. These are the ones that, that nuclear scientists are really interested in because they're very radio, very radioactive, right? There are some poisons in these blue in these blue rows. Things the one that you know you've heard of, I think you've heard a lot about is lead, right? And lead in the water, lead in the pipes, and that's a big one that's down here. That really should not be in your body. That should not be in our in life. But when it does involve itself in life, it causes problems. So, anyways, there's a bunch of atoms. So, you need to know carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Schnapps. It's actually an alcoholic drink, so that's interesting. Oh, yeah. Ger it's a German drink. Schnapps. Carbon. Hydrogen. You have to know this. I've said it twice now. I'll say it a third time. You have to know these. Nitrogen. Oxygen. Phosphorus and sulfur. Schnapps. You have to know these. The, so there's these six elements, plus a bunch of others. Lithium is an important one, and you'll see things like, you know, there's a bunch of others there in those first two or three, four rows of the periodic table, okay, these, that are also intricately involved in this. Iron is another one, right? It's in your blood. Iron's in your blood. It's an important component of red blood cells. But if you talk about biomolecules, these are the main, if they burned you up in an oven and, and got rid of all the water, obviously H2O, that means hydrogen and oxygen, right? But they got rid of all the water and dehydrated you into a pile of, of elements. This is what 99% of the elements, this is not, would be 99% of that pile would be these. So it's important that you understand that these elements are the ones that make you up. From here, we're going to go and we're going to understand, write this down. I still got a couple minutes, so I know some of you put stuff away. I'm sorry for you. Uh, there are there are four different there are four big kinds of molecules that you need to know. You need to know what a carbohydrate is, and those have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Notice, do you see anything else in there? No. They have proteins, which have to do with carbon, hydrogen. Nitrogen and sulfur. All right. Then you have nucleic acids. Which have, again, we're talking mostly, right? Carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. And oxygen. 
And then you have fats. And fats have mostly carbon and hydrogen. What's those four different types of work? Four different kinds of biomolecules. Molecules of life. All right, so we're going to talk more about this tomorrow. Have a good day. If you were marked absent and you were here, I need to see you. Otherwise, I'm marking you absent in Jupiter grades. Come and see me. I will be available for you this afternoon, but for a short time, I have a meeting right after school, so hurry up. So I just said that a chair, the stool you're sitting on, right? Oh, my pencil just died. Right. So the stool you're sitting on is four legs and is made of of wood, right? A bowl of a bowl, well, let's not say cereal, let's say a bowl of sugar. So let's assume you have a bowl of, cere of sugar where you're going to actually scoop it out to put in your cereal. Hopefully you're not going to eat a bowl of cereal. Of sugar, sorry. Although, really, most cereals are pretty much sugar, right? Wow, we're just not going to listen, huh? Listen, so the sugar and the stool are both, the stool is made of sugar. Sugar put together in a certain way makes a stool. And what happens is that you have these building blocks. The building blocks are these glucose molecules. They look like this. They look like that. That's what sugar looks like. We draw it as a hexagon. All right. So we can link them together in a certain way. You can link them together in a certain way. And this link, and this link, they can be very long. You're still talking. I'm, try, I'm trying to explain something. And I'll put it on the quiz just for this class, since you guys need some motivation. So this sugar molecule being connected this way, these things here are called monomers. Together they form a what? Those of you that did your reading yesterday. Polymers. Poly means more than one. So you got monomers put together make polymers. So if you put together these monomers in a certain way, these glucose molecules a certain way, you get something called cellulose. Cellulose is the sugar molecule put together in a certain way that forms these fibers that... Oh, that's not good. I'm drawing a DNA molecule. Together in a certain way, they form these fibers that make it very hard for us to digest. We cannot digest it. Very few things in this world can eat cellulose. The few things that can are some bacteria that live in the gut of termites, right? Termites can't digest bacteria, uh, cellulose, but they have bacteria that can. not So they chop up the wood, put it in their gut, and the bacteria in their gut breaks it down for them. So, and there's mold or fungus. Fungus has some... Let me, you know what, let me put fungi. I don't know, let me just put fungus. Some fungus can eat wood can break down with cellulose. But other than that, that's why wood can last hundreds of years because you need a lot of water. It has to be pretty, if it gets moist, if it gets really wet, the fungus grows really easily so the fungus can break down the cellulose. If it's dry, fungus can't grow very well so it can last hundreds of years. So cellulose is hard to break down. But if you put the same monomer, right, the same sugar molecule, that same molecule together in a different way, you get something called starch. Both are made by plants. Cellulose is made by plants, and starch is made by plants. Starch is found in things like potatoes. Right? In things like yams. Can you eat starch? Yes. Yeah, we can easily digest starch. Even though it's made by plants, we can easily digest them. And when we break them apart, when we take starch, which again is made of these monomers of sugar, 
connected together in a specific way, like Legos, right? We can break this up. Our enzymes can break that up. And what we end up with is sugar. And now this glucose molecule, now we can eat that. We can use that for energy. But we can't, we can't use cellulose for energy because we can't break it up. We can't get the sugar out of that polymer. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> I hope so. so that's, I'm going to put it on the quiz for you all, so you better, I hope you understand that. All right, so what's going on? What's next? Yeah, go ahead. Question? What, what can what they call a dry rod is kind of a misnomer. What happens is when wood gets wet, it get it soaks up the water, and then when it dries, it breaks up the the bond the parts that bond it up, and it breaks apart. But then what also what happens when it gets wet is fungus can grow. If, if fungus starts growing, in it, the, the fungus can break down the, the polymers. All right, is three sixteen. Please finish reading that, that reading. You're going to need it for your quiz tomorrow. Good luck.